Go ahead and turn in your Bibles, at least for now, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The passage which Randy just read for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What we're going to talk about today is your relationships. Your relationships with people in the church and your relationships, more importantly, with people outside of the church. This has been a situation, a thing which we have worked with since the very beginning of the days of Jesus. How do we relate one to another? How do we relate as far as fellowship with the church and with the world? In John chapter 17 and verse 15, Jesus in his prayer, as he is talking about himself, the apostles, and all of us who would follow, he says, Lord, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but I pray that as they are in the world, that you keep them away from Satan. And that's the concept of which we look at as we see this situation, which is right here. Earlier in the chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see the issue of discipline within the church. There's a man who is living with his father's wife in a way in which uh, the people the world even think is weird, is bad, is terrible. And Paul says, you know, as as a church, the Corinthians are accepting of this person. They seem to even glory in the sin which he's doing. And Paul says that the church is to be the church. You've got to keep the church purified. And so you need to expel that person out of the church. But as he continues here in chapter 5, he says, I want you to recognize while the church must remain pure, we also have to have a relationship with the people who are in the world. And going over to chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, we see where Paul, as he's speaking to to these Corinthians, talks about how the reason why they are Christians at that time was because someone had reached out to them. They once were fornicators. They once were idolaters. They once were sinners. But Paul says, you are now washed, sanctified, and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, to make this lesson simple... I'm going to use the best commentary on the Bible, which is the Bible. And so going to our next slide, we juxtapose 1 Corinthians 5 with Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Now, if you read quite a few commentaries on the book of 1 Corinthians, Erdman, uh, Kaufman, uh, Young, some of these other older commentaries actually, Many times what they will point out is 1 Corinthians can be viewed as an application of the Sermon on the Mount. For example, when you get to 1 Corinthians 7 and it's talking about marriage and how marriage should work, that's an explanation, if you will, of Matthew chapter 5 where it talks about marriage in the Sermon on the Mount. When you and I read through 1 Corinthians uh, later in this chapter or chapter six about taking someone to law and someone to court, would you rather not defraud yourself rather than show it in front of everybody else? That goes back to in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, if someone takes your cloak, give them your tunic also. They compel you to go one mile, go several with them as well. And we can go through the Sermon on the Mount in the book of First Corinthians. And it's pretty interesting how the two work together as we work through that. And you'll see that in a lot of older commentaries. You don't see it as much in the newer ones, but the older ones oftentimes would like to point that out. And so as I was getting this lesson ready this week, I was looking at it and I finally decided the easiest way to preach through 1 Corinthians 5 is to actually go back to the Sermon on the Mount. And this is a passage we are perhaps more familiar with, but I think it shows us the exact same lesson. So as we go through, we're going to look at first, uh, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to show how it goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as we see those things. And so the first thing I want us to notice is Jesus, as he is here, speaking through Paul, the Holy Spirit, as he's speaking through Paul, makes that point, first of all, in chapter 5 and verse 13, about how the church needs to remain pure. Now remember, 1 Corinthians 5 starts with the very same concept. You have a man who is either living with his own mother in a marriage relationship, or he's living with a stepmother in a a marriage relationship. It's a very weird thing which is going on. And Paul says you can't do that because the church needs to remain pure. And so what Jesus says in response to this in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, 
is this. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its flavor, how therefore shall it ever be seasoned? You don't put salt in salt to make it salty. It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. The role of the church is to look like Jesus. And you and I are called to be holy even as God himself is holy. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. And so you and I have a responsibility to not look like the world. That's our job. Do not look like the world. Why? Because we don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to the world. We were bought at a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. So in what ways do we not look like the world? Well, we dress like the world. We live in town like the world. We drive cars like the world. But our morals, our goals, the way in which we treat one another need to show Jesus in our heart. And one of the issues that so often happens in the church is that we living in the world begin to look like the world. We treat other people like the world treats other people. We act in ways in which the world acts. We talk in ways in which the the world talks. And so it gets to the point where a person looking back has difficulty telling the difference between someone who loves the Lord and someone who only loves themselves. And so Jesus uses the illustration of a salt shaker. And as you and I look at the idea of a salt shaker, we see that it's sealed off from the world. Why is that? Because if you put salt and pepper together, the flavoring is totally different. It's no longer salt by itself. If you put salt and cinnamon together, it's no longer useful for the purpose of which salt would have. If you put salt and dirt together, it's no longer useful for the purpose in which salt would have. And so what Jesus is saying is in the salt shaker, you and I must be pure. We must be Christian through and through. We must live exactly in the way in which God has called us to live. And so that's what he's talking about here in chapter 5 and verse 13. Now what shocks us, sadly, is many times we don't understand how the world is the world. We look at ungodly people and we wonder, how in the world is it that they act in that way? And in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about that. Don't be shocked when the world hates you. Don't be shocked when the world persecutes you. Don't be shocked when the world doesn't hold the values that you hold. In today's cultural influence and world, it's funny as you watch the news and people are shocked that a corporation does not have godly values. We're shocked that a political party does not have godly values. We're shocked that celebrities do not have godly values. But that's because salt is the church. And that which is not in the church is not salty. There's a difference which is there and a difference which we always have to understand. Going back to John 17, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And so you and I are called to be different, not like the world. But Jesus goes on, as Paul does well, and he speaks not only of purity, but he speaks of principle. And as you and I think about this idea of principle, look there in verse 14. You, he says, changing his analogy here, you are the light of the world. What's the purpose of light? A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand so it shows its light to all the world. Imagine someone who would turn on a flashlight and then hide it in a drawer and shut that drawer. Imagine someone who would turn on a light bulb but then cover that light bulb with something You and I would say, what's the purpose? Why would somebody waste that battery? Why would somebody waste that electricity? Why would somebody waste that power in causing something to brighten up and then totally hide it? 
God looks at you and I today, and sometimes as he looks at the way we live, he has that very same question. What's the purpose? Why is it that we have been redeemed? Why is it that Jesus shed his precious blood to buy us from our sinful selves? Why has he called us into the church and translated us into children of light if we are to never show the world our Christianity? You see, when we think going back to light and we think going back to salt, there is no impact until there's contact. Until the salt leaves the salt shaker... And whoever vacuums, I didn't sprinkle any salt, so there you go. But until the salt leaves the salt shaker, it has no effect. Until the salt comes into contact with something, it has no effect. Until the flashlight is turned on, pulled out of the drawer, and directed in a certain way, that flashlight does absolutely no good. Jesus, as he speaks of this, and Paul as well, speaking to the Corinthians, talks about how we have to have an impact with the world. And the Corinthians knew this. Chapter 6 and verse 11, a passage we just looked at. He said, and such were some of you. They had been fornicators and homosexuals. They had been idolaters. They had been people who lusted, people who had hurt other people, people who had been in sin. But when they came in contact with New Testament Christians, when they came in contact with people who understood and believed the Bible, it changed them and made them into something better, something different, something godly. Here's the issue so often that happens to the church. We're so scared of what might happen. We're so scared of being tainted by the world that we leave the salt in the salt shaker and we bind it and seal it so nothing happens. To bring it to a modern day analogy, we keep our Christianity and we show our Christianity only in a church building. It's only here that we glorify God and that we show the world that we love Jesus. But we don't do it at the plant or at school. We don't do it in our home. We don't do it in our community. We don't do it amongst our friends and amongst our enemies and amongst those who are around. Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every person. Make disciples of the nations, as he would say in that passage. You and I must have the principle of reaching out to other people. To let them know the gospel and to bring them closer. That's closely related to what we see here in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that men may see your good works and they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Here we see proclamation. That is the aspect of the interaction that you and I have with the world. Now, when people see the words that you use, when people see the actions that you use, when people see the attitude that you have, do they see Jesus? And do they see the type of Jesus, our translation of Jesus, that is something that they want. We watch on television. We watch online. We watch in so many different aspects of social media. And in many ways, all that you see of Christians on there is their anger. They're ready to boycott these people or that people or whatever else it might be. They're ready to vote somebody out of office. They're ready to attack and destroy and try to cancel whoever it is that they stand against because they've got to keep that salt pure. But when we're only angry, when we're only boycotting, when we're only working to try to accomplish what we want to happen in this world, and we do it in a bad attitude, 
that doesn't attract people to Jesus. It doesn't attract people to see what God's plan truly is. It's juxtaposed or it works against Paul's principle in Philippians 4 about how we are to rejoice in the Lord always, how we are not to be anxious, how we are to have the peace of God rule in our hearts in all things. You see, you and I, each one of us, proclaim Jesus as we go into the world. Each one of us show who Jesus is and what we think of about him as we go through. As you and I look at this world and look at everything in this world, let me tell you what the solution is. The solution to make this world a better world is not to win a political contest. The the way to make this world to be a better world is not to attain greater power for a political church. The way to make this place a better world is to have more Christians. If we double, if we triple, if we quadruple the size of the church, this world would be a better place. So let me ask you a question. Where do you go and get more Christians? What is it that you do to have more Christians? Well, one thing is you can have children and raise those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And yes, that works, but really that only replaces those who are passing on to their reward in eternity. The way in which you and I make this world a better place is we convert more people to Christ, and the way to convert them is we have to go into the world and bring people to Jesus. And so as we read here in 1 Corinthians 5, what you and I see is Paul, as he's discussing this and bringing this to fruition in chapter 5 and going into chapter 6, he's saying, I want you to be holy. But in your holiness, don't lock yourself up into a monastery. Don't seal the jar. I want you to be holy, but in that holiness, I want you to contact, to come into distance of those who are away from Jesus. Show them why they want to be a Christian. Show them why it's such a wonderful life. Show them the love of Jesus. We look at the light, and as we look at the salt, we see the beauty of the Lord's church. At the end of every lesson, we have a time of invitation, and it's time for you and I, as we approach this point, to think about whether or not we are salt and whether or not we are light, to think about whether or not we are giving ourselves completely and fully to Jesus Christ. What is it God has called you to do? As Jesus would say, come and follow me.